Deacon Jacob, welcome to our program. Thank you, Rudy. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. We've seen you on stage at the Concert for Life, but now we have you in front of a mic and not holding a guitar. Are you out of your element right now? No, not really. I mean, there's only a few times throughout the year that I'm holding a guitar, so it's all good. So, <laughs> Jacob Philip Ramirez. That's right. Do people call you JP? No, no? not really. I've never been Just, called JP. Um, some of my family members call me Jake, uh, but mostly Jacob. Yeah. So Deacon Jacob's fine for anybody. Yeah. yeah. And then eventually Father Jacob. Father. God mm-hmm. willing. God willing in two months, less than two months. Wow. Wow. How does it feel? I can't wait. Uh, it's been a long time coming. You know, that's a, a phrase that people throw around, but yeah, it's been a long journey for me. So uh, I, I, I truly am just excited and feel like this is just the Lord uh, giving his, uh, sharing his goodness with me. And it's just so, so joyful. Seven years now, right? Yeah, this is my seventh year. Um, it's gone by faster than like I can actually recall because it just seems like the other day that I started um, in 2015, because it seems like the other day, but you know, honestly, like seminary can go by very fast, uh-huh. especially when you're getting to know people, you're studying and you're praying. With our schedule, things really do move along and you can blink and there's the end of that year. So there's really no time to stop and, you know. Sure, there is. I mean, we're students, right? So we have these times of stoppage uh-huh. uh, as a true student would in college. You know, we have our breaks, our spring break, our Christmas break. But but to be honest, even those go by quickly because you're trying to catch up with friends or family and then you're going back, back in the grind. <laughs> Did you grow up here, here in Houston? Yes. Uh, born and raised here in the north part of town in spring. Uh, grew up in the Klein School District, went to Klein High School. Um, yeah, I'm from Houston. So was born, uh, I was born and moved out to spring uh, in 1987. What was your home parish? Prince of Peace. Okay, and, and you were born and raised Catholic. That's right. Your family's cradle Catholics mm-hmm. as well? Yeah. What was it like, you know, up there in spring growing? Did you, w- was your family the very involved in the church or were you just Sunday Catholics or every now and then you'd go to church? What was that? Yeah, I would was say there? I fall in the category of being a cradle Catholic. Um, my, our parents, my parents, uh, very much instilled the importance of prayer. So one of that, obviously the biggest, the best form, right? Most powerful form of prayer is the mass. We went to mass every Sunday together. To my recollection, I don't think we ever missed a mass. Even when we traveled, we took a lot of family trips together growing up. We would go to Colorado, to Florida, California, you know, the trips, skiing, to Disney World. Uh-huh. And even when we would travel, I remember as a kid, <laughs> I say this reluctantly now on the <laughs> with a microphone, but I, at times I'm like, man, do we still have to go? I'm like, we're out of town. We're <laughs> every, going. Every kid I mean, thinks like, that, I mean, like we're going though. to Disney World. Do we have to go to church today? I'm like, come on. We're not even at home. So, yes, uh, I'm so thankful that my parents really taught me the importance of of prayer. Sunday Mass, but also going and and uh, making our home just this domestic church, right? We hear about this phrase, this 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 coin, this term, and very much was that. Uh, they taught us that by example, we prayed before meals, we spent time praying together as a family, even on the weekends we'd pray the rosary together. So it, it wasn't it wasn't so much a catechetical type of teaching of the faith when I was a child, uh-huh. but very much by example and expressing the importance by them, uh, expressing the importance of going to church and praying as a family. Did you always think you were going to become a priest? No. So as a child, <laughs> it, there was no idea. You weren't no one of those idea. that that as a young child said, oh, I want to be a priest when I grow up. No. And you know what? And I'm, and I'm okay with that. Uh, to be honest, I've, I've met kids and young, young boys that come up to me after mass where I've spoken to some, some young kids and they're like, man, Deacon Jacob, I can't wait to be a priest. I uh-huh. want to be a priest one day. Uh-huh. 
but that wasn't me. That was not me at all. Um, to be honest, it wasn't until I was 22 years old that I, that the thought of priesthood really just came into my head and just struck me. How many of you are there in the family? I'm the youngest of three. Youngest of three kids. I'm the baby. Um, I have an old a sister, Laura. She's in the middle. And my brother, Nicholas. And I understand your brother's a priest? That's right. Yeah. He's a priest here uh, in Galveston, Houston. He is the pastor of uh, St. Francis Cabrini Catholic Church. Did he enter the seminary much earlier than you did? or? Yeah, a few years. So it's funny. Our... Um, our vocation stories kind of are, are similar in a way and around the same timeline, around the same time period. Uh, so he entered in 2010 um, and I entered in 2015 into the seminary. But um, really the cool part was when I started seminary, my, my first year as a pre-theologian uh-huh. was his last year. So he was a deacon. I am now. Oh. He was a transitional deacon and I was a first year seminarian. So we, we actually overlapped for one year. What? Just one year. Just though. one year. So it was really neat uh, getting to be able to, to share that experience with my brother. That's pretty cool. That's sort of like, kind of like you're a freshman and he's a senior. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh-huh. he, he knew the whole deal. He could show you the ropes a little bit uh-huh. and you were just wide eyed and all of that. And I'm Nicholas's brother. <laughs> hey, Nick's brother. <laughs> <laughs> now you said that you were 22 when you first thought of becoming a priest, what was your teenage life like? Was it um, just pretty much the run of the mill? No. Well, you see, uh, as far as my faith goes, yeah, I mean, my faith really started to develop in high school. It was, yes, I told you that we were cradle Catholic. I was Uh a cradle Catholic growing up, but I didn't really take ownership of my faith before that. It really wasn't something that I had uh, a very hard grasp of or a a good understanding of, right? And that's kind of hard. It takes maturity, right? Yes. It takes maturing to understand that and to to own that. And that started in my uh, my freshman year of high school with a retreat, one of my first retreat. And I remember coming home from that retreat thinking, wow, this is something that I can continue doing. This is a community that I can see myself getting involved with, feeling at home with, uh-huh. and and really just being a part of. So that really kind of started things for me. And that about that time was when I first started uh, getting involved in music, uh, playing guitar. So that was kind of my foot in the door was music ministry. Okay. Um, I, I, the guy who did the worship music at that uh, retreat, I thought he was really cool, really talented. Uh, his name is Dave Reggett, so shout out to Dave. Um, and so that was kind of my foot in the door, and then I joined uh, the 5 p.m. Mass Choir for the Youth Mass. And so from then on out, I was like, okay, I'm involved. Seed was planted, I'm here. And so I'm getting more involved in the youth ministry. I became like on the core team, and that was just kind of my community. So I and really it was always guitar. That's what got me in the door, right? That's what kind uh-huh. of got me in there, playing guitar, being involved in music ministry. But then this like right these roots are are, are really taking uh, uh, taking grasp there yeah and then like I said helping out with retreats in the future mm-hmm. being a core member and drawing others in did you sing as well uh, not so much in high school no uh, that was all <laughs> Dave he's got a beautiful voice uh, I did a little bit later in college uh-huh. um, when it was just kind of me I would I would provide some kind of backup vocals or never the front man of course. Now, is the rest of your family musically inclined as well? Yeah, I would say so. Um, we all pretty much, we all, I think, uh, we all played instruments growing up. So my mom and dad are musically inclined. Uh, they know how to play guitar and sing. Um, I actually played the cello for three years. I started playing cello in fifth grade Oh, and played throughout eighth grade. So uh, in middle school, that was my my music. And regrettably, oh man, I, one of the biggest regrets of my life is quitting the cello the summer of eighth grade year, going into high school and then playing guitar, picking up guitar. My reasoning was, uh, you could say any eighth grader might think this or 
I want to be a rock star, right? I want like I don't want to be a music. I don't want to. How many guys do you know? How many cellists do you know other than Yo Yo Ma, right? But uh-huh. like, I see a lot of rock stars and guitarists. So yeah, I was like, man, I want to. I was the music I was listening to kind of led me into the you know the electric guitar and. And you don't see a lot of girls screaming Yo Yo Ma on, no, <laughs> on the stage, not really. <laughs> but a lot of. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm done with cello. I'm gonna pick up a guitar. Yeah, I kind of taught myself. Yeah. Really? So no lessons? I might have had one or two that I can remember, but it, it just kind of came in naturally to me since I was already a musician playing uh-huh. cello. Oh, yes. So you know up, how to read music I, already. I could, re- I could read music, and it just kind of flowed. Yeah, it just kind of came to me. What, where'd you go to college? I went to Texas Tech University. Okay, quite a ways from here. Yeah, eight and a half hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Were you active in the campus ministry there? Yeah, or? very much so. Um, the awakening program was like the first the first thing that I did, right? So a lot of people hear of the awakening and are familiar with it. Uh, great retreat, great program. That was kind of the first thing that I did to get to know people um, and get involved in the campus ministry. But yeah, very much that was a part of my life, my four years at Tech. It was a, a great community to be a part of. It was good for my social life, for my faith life, for me to uh, to have those friends and a good foundation. A lot of people during college, they feel, you know, the whole college lifestyle and maybe especially since you were so far away, was kind of dragging them away from the the values that their family tried to instill in them. Did you have any of that experience? Not necessarily. Uh, I would say that, yeah, sure, there are times when you go through, uh, or I'll speak for myself. So, yeah, there were times when um, I was going through tough times academically or in a relationship but honestly, it's it was the church community. It was the community there that really I looked to, right? Aside from uh, my confidants, my close friends and family, I was able to to reach out to them in those tough times that I was struggling with, if it, whatever it was. So as far as being away from the faith, I was never away from the faith. Thanks uh-huh. be to God, no. Um, and you weren't pulled away a little bit. By, from, by you know, the college lifestyle, parties and all of that and everything that entails. That's always present, right? It, especially in, um, you could say, secular universities. Uh-huh. But that wasn't something that I really got involved with. Um, may have dabbled, but not something that I really got too deep into. Did your brother also go to Texas Tech? He did. So it, it was that same thing where he was yeah, there a couple that was of years. Yeah, that was the case where I was a freshman, he was a senior, right? Uh-huh. Um, so we actually roomed together for one semester. Oh, that's cool. At Tech. Um, so that was neat. Totally different experience, right? From living, living together in college <laughs> and living together in seminary. Um, you don't have the parents as the, the referees. No parents. You two no, had to figure it out. Yeah, no formators. So it was just us. <laughs> Very much a time of maturing, um, and I, I'm thankful for my for what I had out there at Tech. Um, I'm still very much close to the priest who was the vocation director there. Mm. He's very he was very instrumental in my in my vocation. He was kind of the first priest that I spoke to about priesthood. I reached out to him and said, "Tell, me, I got this this feeling and I got this this desire. Tell me about priesthood." Like lead me in in a way that I should go. And how? Uh, what did he say to you? And yeah, yeah, he was a very uh, a very holy man, very simple man, uh, and I'm so so thankful for his friendship. I'm still friends with him now. Matter of fact, he'll be vesting me as a priest at my ordination this June. That is fantastic. Well, um, what's his name? His name is Father Rene. Father Rene. I still talk to him. We still joke with each other. Yeah, he's a funny man. But again, somebody who was there for me in tough times, uh-huh. someone who was able to show me a good model of priesthood and a good model is like, this is what a shepherd is. This is who a shepherd is. And just a great example of a priest. Did you complete your degree? I did. Texas Tech? I okay. did. So you weren't like Father Houston who stopped near the home stretch? No, I, no, I actually <laughs> wanted to um, because when I, when I received that call, uh-huh. It was my. It was the beginning of my senior year at Tech, 
And man, I was like a kid who had just like discovered, I don't know, Candy World or something. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I got to get more of this. So I called Father Dat, right? At the time, he was a vocation director. Uh huh. I was like, Father Dat, I want to become a priest. I want to join seminary. Like, sign me up. Can I join tomorrow? He's like, Hey man, doesn't doesn't work like that, Jacob. Let's just take it one step at a time. Uh huh. A lot of wisdom, right? A lot of wisdom there. So yeah, uh, he advised me to continue with school. He said, Jacob, I'm glad you reached out to me, but I want you to continue with school and finish your degree. You're almost there. He's like, this uh-huh. is your senior year. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and finish? So. I would have thought he'd say, hey, oh, yeah, sure, we need priests. Well, Jump sure, in, we but... always need priests. Um, <laughs> true. But yeah, again, going back to the wisdom and yeah. providence. Um, yeah. Yeah, he knew what he was talking about. He yeah. could kind of sense. And so I was, yeah, I went back to school and a few months later I had a girlfriend. So I was like, it was kind of back, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, that was very much a struggle for me. A struggle in the sense of like, is this really for me? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, just when you... Start thinking about becoming a priest. That's when you get the girlfriend. Did you have a girlfriend before the thoughts of the Yeah, priest? yeah. I, I dated throughout. How serious? In college, pretty serious. Uh, yeah, we were talking about marriage my junior year. Oh, wow. Um, we were talking about it. I wasn't like, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. propose or anything. Uh-huh. But, but no, I dated her for uh, close to two years, and um, that was definitely on the table. Did, did your thoughts of priesthood, is that what the— uh, Cause the end of the uh, relationship? That was part of it. Part of it was that, and part of it was just, you know, differences in the relationship. But, uh-huh. um, but yeah, that was definitely on the table. That was something that came into play for sure. And it, it was something that was difficult to, to juggle and to discern. That's why I'm so thankful for Father Rene. He helped me out a lot. Mm. Father, Father Dat was very instrumental in, in my discernment and my home. Uh, was she the, Catholic as well? Yeah. yeah. So she kind of understood when... Did you share your thoughts of? I did. Yeah, I was, I was, I was upfront about it. How, how was she with that? Okay, she was. You know, I don't know. Maybe a little blindsided, I would say. But, but also, yeah, because you're two years into the relationship, <laughs> and the, <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. But right, but naturally. But then again, not like, uh, oh man, I would just. How could you? But uh-huh. understanding what it is, it's a calling to. And then this girl that you met afterwards. Uh-huh. How did that, uh, did that? Well, I had already known them, right? So I told you I was involved in in a campus ministry there at Tech. So, oh, so she was as well. Uh-huh. They were as well. Um, that's, that's kind of where my dating mostly happened was within the church circle. <laughs> so I, I would think that maybe they have it in their mind that, oh, okay, this guy's in the campus this ministry. Be, There's a possibility. This could be a possibility yeah. maybe, but then again, it's like, well, maybe not. Father Dad, uh, when he was on the show, he joked about, you know, every time he'd visit a campus or, or a parish, the girls would be like, hide your boyfriends. Father Dad's here. He's going to want to make, he's going <laughs> to pull them towards the priesthood. <laughs> he, hide he your joked. boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so you, did you struggle with that for a long time with the, that girlfriend and the thoughts of priesthood? Yeah, I would say kind of that entire senior year. Um very much a back and forth, very much a, um, a struggle as far as um, really asking, really truly discerning where God was leading me to. And it became evident at the, towards the end of the year, my senior year, that it was, it was not to, not to marriage with this, with this girl, with my girlfriend. So how did she react to that? If you don't want me asking. Uh, she was supportive in the fact that why well, I told her, um, and so thankful for that. She was a wonderful woman. Um, nothing but great things to say about her. Mm-hmm. Did she say something like, you better see this thing through all the way? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> if you're going to dump me, see this thing through. And here you are. Here I am. Right at the home stretch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So after graduation, how long was it before you entered the seminary? Five years. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't right away, even though no. you had those thoughts. Even though. Wow. Yeah, I mentioned it was a back and forth, right? Uh-huh. It was very much a back and forth. Uh, it wasn't, so I graduated from tech in 2010, right? And I didn't enter until 2015. Okay. Yeah, my life is just, 
you can you can sum it up in in the word of like just searching, right? I was I've been searching, I've been looking for for most of my life, not knowing what I wanted to do. When I went to tech, I I graduated. I studied communications, right? I graduated with a degree in communications in Spanish, but I changed my major like three times. Oh, so I didn't know. I wasn't like the friends that I had. I was kind of like the oddball out, right? They were studying medicine. They were studying law. They knew what they had in front of them. They knew what they're going to be doing. And I was like, man, I can do anything with my degree. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But really, that was the Lord kind of preparing me for that. Um, so they were the hyper-focused ones, and you were the one like, well, we'll see how it goes and exactly. where I land. We'll see where I land. We'll see where I land. So five years. So you went into the private sector. You I did. worked. What, I what did. did you do? Well, I mean... <laughs> I did a few different jobs. Uh, I mean, I was working. Uh, a friend of mine was very helpful with uh, with me finding a job after after school. Uh huh. After graduating, his uh, his his parents owned a company, so I worked actually at a wastewater plant for like oh. almost a year. Not the most luxurious or glorious uh-huh. <laughs> jobs, but it was a paycheck, and I was thankful for. The experience that I had. And it was like, if, if I recall correctly, it was the recession when you graduated, right? Yeah. on the, During it, uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, so you were, you, you bounced around. I bounced different... around a lot of different jobs. I was working in Houston. I moved to California. I was doing some ministry there with a friend of mine. Uh-huh. I was working like for the the National Forest Service. Oh, wow. The Sequoia Nationals. <laughs> you went everywhere, huh? Yeah. And then I moved back to Houston and that's when I got involved in education. That's when the Lord put that in front of me. And I was so thankful he did. It was a, a wonderful part of my life. But yeah, I when I when I moved back to Houston, I got into into teaching. I, I was looking for some temporary jobs, some temporary employment. So you substituted for a while? I did. I was a sub. I was a temp, right? I'm temping. Which school district? In Klein, uh-huh. in Tomball. Uh, okay. In private schools, the Catholic schools around the area, St. Saint, Saint Anne's and Tomball, Northwoods at the time. Uh, so I started subbing and then I was like, man, this is something that I could see myself doing. Uh, so I was looking into getting an alter- alternative certification and just teaching full time. But then the Lord put this uh, in my path, uh, this program, this graduate program at UST, at University of St. Thomas. So I ended up going through with that and received a master's of education of Catholic education oh. through University of St. Thomas. That's awesome. So it was a wonderful program. Uh, uh-huh. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was a great two-year program where you lived in like a quasi-community. Okay. And you you worked full-time and you also went to school. So you're a full-time student, full-time, full-time uh, employee. So they kind of help you find a job in a Catholic school and you're studying, you're taking classes. The program was geared towards making solid Catholic teachers within the Archdiocese, Mm. especially kind of focusing on the inner city schools. Now, um, it was a wonderful program and I was thankful to be a part of it. It taught me a lot of of skills and, and what I have today because of that. Oh, well, you know, you're talking to another teacher too, because I was a, yeah, I substitute here and there. And then I I taught SPED for a while as well. So I went through the whole alternative certification, not Mm -hmm. the route you went through, Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So now you're, during this whole process, this five years of, you know, working in the uh, private sector on and off, you know, you're not really looking at the priesthood. Uh, Were you still dating as well there or did you just... Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had not yet completely said, okay, I'm going to, you know, look at the priesthood uh, while I, you know, try working. So it was, you were still trying things out, like you said. Still still searching, still trying <laughs> things out, right? Still trying it on. Now, how did your family take your decision to enter the seminary? Uh, supportive. So obviously my brother uh, at the time was <laughs> supportive. He was already... He was already in seminary, um, and my parents uh, were supportive as well. My dad, on the other hand, um, he was actually in the seminary for two years. Really? So my dad was in at St. Mary's Seminary for two years back in like the early 80s, um, 
and he was there for two years and then left because he met my mom uh, when he was taking a class at UST. So he had been there, right? And he left. And he, uh-huh. he discerned out. So I think he was kind of along the mindset of like, okay, let's we'll see what happens. I've been there, Jacob. You know, I've I did that too. Not that he wasn't happy for me, but he was just like, okay, we'll take it. We'll see what happens. Take it a step at a time. Do you think he looked at you saying, oh, he's a dilly dallier. He's, he's just experimenting. Maybe, maybe in a little sense, maybe not all the way totally, but, uh-huh. um, but definitely an element there. So my parents were very much involved. The family were supportive. And especially with my dad, there is, there's something that's really important here that kind of led me to hearing this call to the priesthood. It had to do with a conversation I had with my dad at the beginning of my senior year of college. So in 2009, Pope Benedict XVI declared 2009 the year of the priest. I don't know if you can remember that, but it was the year of the priest, and that was when everything started to click. Everything started to make sense. Oh, The ball started rolling from then on out. Um, I mean, homilies were mentioning at, at Mass, you know, St. John Vianney, the priesthood. Uh-huh. And... Um, so there was a conversation I had with my dad right before I started my senior year. I was at home. I was about to head back to, to Lubbock to start the year. And my dad asked this question. So, Jacob, what, what are your plans after college? Mm-hmm. I mentioned before that I didn't really necessarily know. I didn't have my vision of what I wanted to do. I was studying communications in Spanish. So I don't have that planned out for me. But now my dad is a very much a type A Right. He works in construction. He's a project manager. Okay. So he expects answers and you know, this and that. And like what's 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 gonna happen, right? Okay. Like, so he's asking me these questions and I'm like, I didn't have answers to them. Uh-huh. So I don't know what it is. Maybe it was just being selfish, but as a man, it was difficult for me to not have an answer from my dad. It's like I don't know. I can't tell you what I'm gonna do. I know I'll be financially responsible. I'll be on my own. Uh huh. I just don't know. Did it frustrate him? That, um, maybe a little, but I think the frustrating part was more internal for me. Mm. It was more of like, I feel inadequate. I can't, I can't give an answer. Uh huh. That was difficult for me to swallow that. So I, it was an emotional part that ended up, I remember <laughs> this was a conversation that was, man, I just wanted to get out of it. And so something inside of me just said, go and pray about it. So, I went to my home parish. I went to church. I went to adoration. I went and dropped on my knees in front of our Lord in the the tabernacle. And I just flat out said, lead me, Lord. I I said, show me my path. Give me some sort of a sign. Lord, just lead me to where I need to go. And so he did. Um, Later on that week when when I went back and started my senior year in Lubbock, I went to confession, right? I went to I went to confession to my usual confessor. So when I'm at confession, I was sharing with him my strife, my struggle, how I was just in this inner turmoil of not knowing my future, not knowing how to uh, answer my dad of, of my plans, uh-huh. right? these, these expectations. Yeah. And so that really got to me. And I was sharing all that with him. And the priest, uh, Monsignor Ben, just very plainly and very gently just looked at me and said, Jacob, consider the priesthood. Just like that. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a forceful, like, well, why don't you do this or that? Like, uh-huh. No, it was like an invitation. But how beautiful it was. R- right? We know that during the sacrament, that's uh, the Holy Spirit working through the priest. So the Holy Spirit planted that seed of priesthood at that time. And from then on out, it began to just grow rapidly. So it was just a beautiful, beautiful time of grace that I received in that sacrament. Would it have been different if he was a f- forceful? You got to try this. Maybe, you know? you, maybe. You, you might have um, reacted differently. Possibly, but but that was just exactly how it was supposed to be. Yes. I was in the, the perfect. Uh, yeah. It all added up. I was in uh-huh. the right frame of mind, but it was because I made that point of surrender, right? I went to adoration and said, Lord, I surrender to you. I don't know what I'm going to do. Only you have the answers for me. 
where was that point where you just, you know, finally said, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm going to explore going into the seminary completely. It came, uh, in 2015, or I guess late 14, right? Late 2014. Uh, I was teaching at St. Rose of Lima Catholic school. I was teaching Spanish there and, um, my brother at the time was, uh, uh, I forget how many years into his priesthood, but calls me up one day and still knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm teaching. Um, and he just calls me up one day. He's like, Hey bro, uh, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm a Catholic school teacher. It's a respectable job. I yeah. Like, right. What do you mean, bro? He's several years in already. Several years in the priesthood. He's like, hey, so so what's going on? What are you doing with your life? Uh huh. Because he knows, right? He knows I've been discerning. He knows I've okay. been back and forth. So this, this is, is something you shared with your yeah, family. My, okay. Absolutely. Sorry, okay. I didn't mention that before, but very much something that my family knew about. They were supportive. They were helpful in the, in the way that they were listening. And, and so my brother knew everything. My uh-huh. brother knew my struggles, my desires, my kind of. Uh, struggles back and forth, but is this for me? Is this not? Um, so he knew everything, and uh, my brother and I are very close. But yeah, he calls me up and says, "Say, bro, what are you, what are you doing?" Uh huh. And I'm like, "Man, it's like, well, what are you going to do with seminary? Is that something that you're still thinking about?" And yeah, so, so those those five years between after I graduated until I joined, that was still something that I did not completely shut the door on. I did not uh-huh. shut the door on that because I knew that hopefully that would still be something that came through. So here's the crux of this, of the story. Um, there was this kind of, I was put in, in, a, in a weird, not a weird, but a tough situation where I had to make a, a, a crucial decision. Um, I got a call about a job opportunity around November. And um, so it would have been an upgrade, you know, it would have been a, not an upgrade, but a, um, it's a different opportunity. Uh huh. And so, with more pay. So I was thinking, well, this is, this seems like it could work out for me. Uh huh. And then that, right. My brother called, then I, these weird things started happening. Like my, uh, my friends at work were, would ask me, Hey Jacob, aren't you thinking about being a priest? I'm like, how'd you know that? I didn't tell you. Really? Family members would call me up. Jacob, what are you thinking? Like, wh- what about priesthood? Just out of the blue. Out of the blue. I mean, around the same time. Right. So my brother calls me, I have, Friends at work asked me about priesthood. Family members asked me about it. So the Lord was was picking at me, uh-huh. like knocking at the door, saying, "Don't forget about this." <laughs> yeah, so stop dilly dallying. Stop dilly dallying. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know. So I had a tough situation where I had this new job offer, which would have been a big raise, and then I'm like, or I could maybe apply to seminary and see if I get accepted. Uh huh. I'm so thankful for. Uh, the pastor and my spiritual director was very helpful, but also um, Father Clint. Father Clint was the pastor of uh, St. Rosa Lima at the time. And I was, I had known him before because my family knows him. So he was helpful of kind of talking this through. He had been a vocation director, so he kind of knew how to lead the conversation, uh-huh. but he was very helpful. And essentially it just came down to the fa- the decision of, do I move forward? with seminary and chance and chance it of not getting accepted or do I just take this job? Uh Uh-huh. Which knowing that I would, it could be a great new opportunity. Yes. I meant I made the choice. It was tough, but I said, you know what? I'm going to just turn this down and I'm going to move forward with seminary. Wow. So I said, that must've been a tough decision. Thank you for the offer, but I'm going to move forward. I believe God is calling me to the priesthood. So there's only so much discerning you can do outside seminary, right? Uh Uh-huh. You have to move forward. And take the next step. Yeah. That was the next step for me. Did you think in the back of your mind, oh, what if this seminary thing doesn't work out? I just let go of this opportunity. Yeah, with the absolutely. I thought about it a lot. <laughs> that was one of my worries. I was like, shoot, what if this doesn't work? Uh huh. What if this doesn't work and I'm quitting my job at the end of the year? You know, I'm, I told the principal that I wouldn't be back teaching the next year. So yeah, that was very much a part of my my thought process. Is that a big thing for a lot of people thinking about going to the seminary, you know, just cutting your life and then thinking, oh, I can't just jump back in. I'm going to have a hard time resetting everything. Possibly. Um, that was definitely one for me. And I would say general, just generalizing, I would say it's probably something that you have to at least think about and it's got to be at the back of your head. 
but it's a it's a risk worth taking, right? In my opinion, it's 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 worth it, right? Did you have any thought of perhaps you know pressure of carrying on the family name since your brother was a priest? You know, the only people who mentioned that to me were some friends of mine, friends of mine from college, friends from high school, and some friends of mine who aren't Catholic. <laughs> They were the only ones who said, but Jacob, what about your family name? Uh huh. You're the only Ramirez boy left. Like, yes. there'll be no more after you. I'm like, yeah, so I'll have a lot more spiritual children though than uh-huh. I could ever, ever imagine. So yeah, only from those who, uh, who weren't Catholic and who's those who didn't necessarily understand the, the gift of the priesthood. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is your uncle a priest as well? He is. Okay. He, Did he factor into your discernment? Um, well, yes. Yes and no. Um, growing up, uh, yeah, yeah, I had a, had a priest uncle, um, Uncle Oscar, I still call him that, right? I still call him Uncle Oscar. He's still Uncle Oscar to me. But um, that well, was, I guess, the, a subtle way that kind of played into it. Okay. Because that was something that was familiar to me. Mm. I have memories of going to his rectory. We would have parties there, cookouts. Uh-huh. I have a lot of cousins. My mom is one of eight kids, so I have okay. a lot of cousins. We would have a lot of time of recreation and parties uh, with him. So it was normal having a it priest in the family. It was normal to me. I was like, isn't that how every family is? But no, uh-huh. it's not, but... But it was normal to me. So it was something that I actually brought up with him and, and spoke to him. He was he was very supportive. And did, did you have a see him a lot or was he too, too busy being a priest that you didn't get to well, see? Well, at that time, I didn't see him a lot. He was, so at that point, he had already been made bishop. So uh, my uncle is a bishop and he was made a bishop in 2007. Okay. So he was a priest of this diocese. He was, he's from Houston uh-huh. and then was made bishop, auxiliary bishop in San Antonio. So at that time, when I was going through all this, he was in San Antonio. Okay. So I would still, yeah, I would talk on the phone, would see him every now and then. But not not so many face to face conversations, unlike with your, you know, with your brother, with my brother, or or with your, you know, your parish priest and all of that. Okay. Yeah. So you jump in to the seminary. Now, are you still feeling things out like you've been? Over the past few years, because we've had some some guests say that they came in and they said they came with the attitude of, okay, let's see what happens. Other guests were like, nope, I'm starting this. We're going straight. I'm going to see this thing through. What were you like? No, I was not like that. So <laughs> that, because that was my life before, right? Uh-huh. That was what I did. Let's see. Let's, let's work it. Let's see if it works out. No, I had turned down the job. Remember, I had... T- I had spent all those years <laughs> dating, not dating, uh, like back and forth. I'm uh-huh. like, man, I can't keep doing this. Yes. But honestly, I had so much peace, Rudy. I had so much peace when I made the decision to go and join seminary. I knew that this is what God was, this was the next step, right? This was what the Lord was asking of me to move forward and to go. So no, I didn't really have that, that idea of, oh, well, if this works out, that'd be wonderful. I'm like, no, this is it. Uh-huh. This is what the Lord's calling me to, and I can't wait for it. So when I joined, it was a great first year, new and exciting, but also it had a little bit of a leg up on some of the new guys because my brother was in seminary. So oh, yeah. I got to know a lot of the seminary community. Okay. So I already knew, of, I got to know a lot of the guys there, Father yeah. Preston, right? Father Coy. I had known, had met a lot of these guys, Father Justin Cormy. And so it was, it was, I, I felt so blessed to already join seminary and have a group of friends already there. As compared to other guys who just come in dry without yeah. knowing anyone. You know? Everything's new for Everything's them. Everything's new. Wow. I had a little leg up because I knew what to expect because my brother, yeah, we're close. We talked about the process, what to expect. And so plus, it wasn't that big of a, an adjustment coming in. Well, in, in that respect, in the okay. respect of not knowing people and knowing what to expect. It was a jump a big jump in far, as far as like just the schedule, right? You mean I'm not a I'm not a I'm not earning a salary anymore. I'm oh, not, yeah. I don't have my own house. Uh huh. Don't have my own all these other luxuries, right? But no, this is this is a totally different life, right? You take a back seat, and I'm being there. To, I'm there to be formed. Yes, I'm in seminary to be formed to Christ. And you're taking orders. Yeah. Again, mm-hmm. like when you were much younger. 
Exactly. Did you have difficulty with that? You know, you you're a student again. You're taking orders again. There, you know, you're following a very strict schedule. Expectations. Where it, yeah, as compared to the five years that you were, you were the one dictating your schedule and your your life. You, you know what? It came. I think it came at a good time. I welcomed it. It, it was. Yeah, it was, an, it was an adjustment. I would say, honestly, that first kind of year, my first year was an adjustment year. Uh huh. Getting used to right the the curfew, the the regiment, the schedule, the horarium of of a prayer class, prayer class, prayer class. You know, uh-huh. spending time together. But but no, it was it was a welcomed change of pace. Now your first year, and in the first year, I understand that a, a lot of people after. Or sometime during their first year, a lot of the seminarians, they start to discern out. Mm -hmm. Was there a big group that discerned out during your first year? There was a few, a handful. Um, To my recollection, I think within the first two years I was there, there was probably a handful of guys who left. Was Um, it difficult for you? You know, getting to know these guys and then suddenly they, you know, they stopped showing up. Yeah, some of them did. Um, Yeah. Some of it was kind of a surprise, to be honest. But but then again, that's what seminary is about, right? Uh, I, told, I mentioned earlier, it's the next step, right? Uh-huh. This is what you have to do. This is the next step. It, being in seminary is not a guarantee you'll be a priest, right? We all we all know there's an evaluation process. So yes. I'm evaluated at the end of every year to see if this is for me, right? It's not just me discerning, but it's the church and the Holy Spirit working together. Because you may want to do it exactly. and, and the church may uh, thanks just be the, decide. Thanks be to yeah. God it's like that. You know, we don't want this, <laughs> anyone going in there, hey, I'm supposed to be a priest, give me the priesthood. Uh-huh. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. We'd have a lot of crazies out there. <laughs> <laughs> Those first years, was, was there a point where you got really close to discerning out? No, no. But there was anything, if I could just share anything kind of in that same realm, it was during my pastoral year. So after second theology and third, the, uh, between second and third theology, there's what's called a pastoral year, right? It's uh-huh. like an internship year. So I spent my time at St. Martha's in Kingwood. Okay. And during that time, I never thought about leaving. But what I did go through, and I'll share this because it's, it's I'm sure this is kind of normal for most guys, I would say, and healthy to kind of go through in your time of, of discernment. So I kind of went through a period of kind of mourning the loss of a family. Mm. Now it might sound kind of weird phrasing to you, but it was really just coming to the understanding and the real, the realization that I won't have a family yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. Biological family. Uh huh. Um, so it was, that was something I worked through my, uh, worked with through my spiritual director and that was something that I kind of, yeah, spent s- several months praying with uh, and praying about and, and speaking about with with my uh, close friends and priests that I knew and my brother. But yeah, that was very much a time that, it, that I kind of spent like mourning that, seeing, being in the parish, living there day in and day out, you see the beauty of the family life. You see the domestic church oh, and seeing, yeah. I got to know so many of these families well. And seeing them come to daily mass, getting to know them, I'm like, man, this is a wonderful, wonderful vocation, and it is. Yes, and we need holy, Catholic, solid families. And you entered the priesthood after several years living in the private sector. It's not like you entered out of high school, so right. you had all of those extra years thinking that you may get married and have children and have your own family. Exactly. So exactly. Th- that's those extra years of that being in your mind, and. Y- now you have to kind of tackle that. Well, remember, that was something that I always wanted. So it wasn't until I mentioned, until I was 22, yes. that the idea of priesthood came to my came to me. Uh huh. So for those first 21 years, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a dad. Yeah. I'm going to be a husband. Wow. So that, that was something that I wanted. That must, you must have shed a lot of tears just thinking about that. Yeah. You can say that. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a, yeah. Because we, we have had guests who said that, that they have had difficulty with just the concept of celibacy, of never having a family, you know? So what thought got into your mind or or was there a turning point 
where you said, okay, you finally said you were able to, to get over that? Yeah. Well, th- through, through direction and prayer, I, I realized that this was a gift that the Lord was giving me. He was allowing me to go through this as a gift to see the beauty of the married life, to see the beauty of the family, to appreciate it for what it is and to recognize it. Right. Uh huh. But then he reassured me in my vocation, reassured me through that of, of my calling to the priesthood. Who was the, the parish priest at the time at St. Martha? Father TJ. Okay. And he, I'm sure he, he gave you a bit of advice as well, huh? He did. Yeah. He was very helpful. He's, he's a, a good pastor. He's a good shepherd and, you know, very easy to talk to. So yeah, I'm very upfront with him and I, I, I shared with him kind of what I was going through the time. He's like, yeah, that's, that's normal, Jacob. You should be going through that or asking questions like these because that's important. You want to be sure and you want to know that this is for you. So when you finish that pastoral year, you go back into the seminary. Mm -hmm. Are you reinvigorated? Yes. Yes, very much so. Coming back from from pastoral year, it's a wonderful time of you come back full of energy, come back with experience in the parish. And then you come back to classes. It's like, oh man, <laughs> I forgot about being a student. Because when you're on pastoral year, you don't take classes. You're uh-huh. just your your focus is being in the parish, right? Living that life. Living that life. So that's what it is, and that's what it was for me. Um, a little bit of a, a little bit of an adjustment coming back into the orarium of the seminary, right? Being uh-huh. a full time student again. And getting used to that. So a little bit of an adjustment coming back. I was like, man, I can't wait to get back out there. Uh-huh. But got two more years before I can do that. Um, where are you now right now in your deaconate year? As a deacon, I'm assigned to Blessed Sacrament uh, Catholic Church. It's kind of Edo area. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's a very, uh, very much a small parish, right? Uh-huh. It's a small parish and different from what I'm used to. I mean, growing up, I, Prince yeah, St. Martha is, St. Martha is huge. Prince huge. of Peace is huge, right? <laughs> yeah. Two huge parishes, suburban parishes. And this is inner city. Uh-huh. This is a small, poor Hispanic parish. So it's, it's uh, mostly Spanish speaking. Yep. Three Spanish masses and two English. And uh, the ones in Spanish are more uh, populated. Do you Did you grow up speaking Spanish? No. Uh, my parents did. My parents are, are, are both fluent, um, but... They, they didn't speak Spanish to us as kids, so... Maybe when they were mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> I speak... So when I'm mad at my son, I speak to him in well, Filipino Yeah, sometimes. maybe I heard a few <laughs> words I shouldn't have from my dad. My mother would never say those words, but... No, yeah, that, they spoke Spanish to each other, right? And I knew I picked up things here and there, so I, I kind of could get around, but... Uh-huh. No, I didn't speak it at all. So did you have to learn it in the seminary? Was I, part le- of that? I learned in high school. I took Spanish in okay. middle, middle school, high school... I studied Spanish at Tech, um, so that was very that was part of my of my study. So, are you fluent now? Um, no, I'm not going to say fluent. Um, I'm I'm. You can get by. I, oh, I'm more than just getting by too. I'm I'm very. I would say I'm uh, proficient. Okay, that's a better way to say it. <laughs> okay, so it's, you're still there's still room for improvement. Always. Yeah. Always. <laughs> I'm like I'm still with, learning new words with my with my wife. She still corrects my Filipino. Because I also learned it, you know, later on. I, mm-hmm. I didn't grow up speaking Filipino, even though my parents, mm-hmm. you know, they, they said some words to me in Filipino when I was growing up. <laughs> but anyway, so now you're in your diaconate year. You're in the, you're looking at the home stretch right now. Yeah. You know, um, what are you looking forward to the most when it comes to becoming a priest? Well... There's a lot of things, right? But if I could focus on on two that I'm really looking forward to is um, really just being a sacrament of God's healing mercy, being an instrument, rather, an instrument of his mercy. I received my call to the priesthood in the sacrament of confession. Who was this priest? Uh, he was a Monsignor, Monsignor Ben, um, there in, in Lubbock when I, was okay. at, when I was at Tech. So... Um, uh, it's funny. I remember walking out of that confessional. I was like, man, I told my buddy who I was with, you'll never believe what he just told me. He's like, I told him to consider the priest. I was like, he knows my sins. Why would he tell me that? <laughs> so yeah, I have this love, this, this wonderful, just 
eagerness um, to just be an instrument of God's love and mercy. So confession um, and and being with those in need who are near the end of their life. So a mm. lot of times we, as priests, they get sick calls, right? Yes. Emergency calls. Yeah. Um, I've had some wonderful experiences, um, some very moving experiences, uh, being an accompanying priest during those times. Wow. So I would love to just, uh, I would, I welcome that. I look forward to that. Being the person there who can hold the hand of a family member and just help them through that, that time. Wow. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So going back to your current assignment, now you said this is a small parish. What are the biggest differences that you've noticed, you know, between your diaconate year now and your, let's say, growing up in a large parish or your time in St. Martha during your, um, during your pastoral year? Well, there's a lot of differences, but I mean, first is just the size, right? I mean, at Prince of Peace and at St. Martha, I don't know how many ministries there are, programs, you know, Uh 100, something like that, 50 to 100, and and employees, right? But, I mean, we have one employee at Blessed Sacrament, full-time. And so it's just, and a lot of it is is based on volunteers, right? People coming from the community, stepping up Uh and taking ownership of their community and and giving their time. So for me, it's just um, adjusting to that, adjusting to just the sheer size uh, it's a lot more intimate. Yes, uh, you very get to know much people. more. Yeah. yeah, get to know people on a more personal level, which uh-huh. is nice. More familiar faces, and there's not as many to remember, right? <laughs> or to to me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so uh, it's it's tough. For oh, me. I'm remembering names. Terrible like, at oh. names. Oh, yeah. After mass, shaking hands, I'm like, it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, well, with this podcast, people are you know getting to 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 kind of know me, and I, I don't know. Do I really know this person? I'm sure you, as you know, as a yeah. as a deacon, you have that experience. Like, oh, this is the first time I'm meeting this person. Is it not? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sure because you're a very visible person in the right. parish. So at least it's it's a little easier at that Blessed Sacrament. It is, yeah. Not as many people, not as as many uh, programs and ministries, but yeah, it's it's a wonderful parish. The people there are just uh, uh, wonderfully hospitable you with your experiences with a large parish and a small parish when you're looking forward to your priestly life what what are you thinking about are you thinking about a larger or a smaller parish eventually settling into as an assignment i imagine for my first assignment i'll be sent to a larger maybe a medium parish because they need more help sure i would say so i think it's kind of the trend Uh right recently um i think that's just to uh to give us experience and have mentorship, right? To have more things to do and to learn from. I think eventually I'll, I'll be sent to a, a smaller parish or medium to small parish. Uh, kind of like where my brother, I mean, it's not, it's funny though with numbers because you can talk about a different diocese, Victoria, Brownsville. Uh huh. And a parish with 3,000 families is a huge parish to them. But here in Houston, like that's small. <laughs> you know, I've talked to, to different seminarians like, 3,000 families, that's a enormous parish in my diocese. Like, uh-huh. you know, not so much here in Houston. So, so you have no real preference? No, I mean, I would, yeah, I would like to be at a, at a parish, I would say, medium to larger for, to, to learn more from uh, first off. And, and I would love to eventually be at a, par- at a parish that has a school. Mm. I would love to be involved, you know, in the as school. As a former teacher, yes. Yeah, as a former teacher, former coach. You know, when I was teaching, I, I helped coach baseball and football, middle school boys. So it was fun. That was awesome. Would you think about teaching again, theology in the classroom, if that was a... If I needed to. I mean, if they couldn't find anybody. I mean, it's funny, on pastoral year, when I was at St. Martha, uh-huh. one of the things that I did a lot was sub. because. <laughs> Oh, so they knew I was uh, you know, I had to spend time teaching. So they're like, "Hey, Jacob, the calls at like six a.m. Uh-huh. We need a sub. Can you come in today?" <laughs> sure, no problem. So I would tell Fire TJ, "I'm a teacher today. Find me at the school." Let's double back to seminary in life or life in the seminary. Now, Deacon Christopher told us this story about a prank that was pulled on you. 
Oh Dur- <laughs> my gosh. I was hoping you wouldn't bring this up. <laughs> my father, Chad. Now we heard his side of the story. What, what was uh-huh. it like for you on your end? Uh, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's not much else to say about it. He, he got me pretty good. Was that? It was a great, it was well done, well crafted. Was that pretty much accurate the way that uh, Deacon Christopher described it? Did you see the interview? I, I saw some parts of it. I didn't see the whole thing. Um, I didn't want to bring up old memories. Of that story? Memories, that story. <laughs> Deacon Christopher loves to share that story with everyone he meets. Um, he takes pride in it. <laughs> but um, it's funny how Father Chad didn't even mention it. But it was, yeah, that was, it was it, Deacon yeah. Chris who brought it up. Uh, when you received that letter, so, you know, as just to, to give a backgrounder on it. So you receive a letter saying that you were supposed to have a money from the Knights of Columbus. And there's a, there's a phone number in the letter. So you're all excited. You call the phone number and it's Father Chad. Father Chad. What did you, what was going through your mind at that moment, that, that moment of realization? Just total disbelief. I was like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? Is this really <laughs> like, you know, you like, you see the show pranked, you know, or yeah. Uh, what was that show that um, punk? Punk, that, yeah, punk, punk. Yes, not prank. Yeah, I was like, man, you're on an episode of Punk or whatever. I was like, gosh, <laughs> this is this sucks. Did he um, did he do that things like that to you a lot? I mean, nothing to that extent. I mean, that was huge. It was elaborate. Yes, it was very elaborate and intricate, and took him a lot of time to. <laughs> did you um, get him back? No, I haven't gotten him back yet. <laughs> Well, who knows? Who knows what will happen? I don't hold grudges, Rudy. Come on. Were there a lot of pranks that you in in the seminary that you were involved in or witnessed at least? I, I mean, I would say nothing to nothing like that with um, that elaborate. I mean, little things here and there, playfulness, you know, stuff with sports. Um, sure, but. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't say that's something that I put a lot of time into. I uh-huh. mean, just kind of playfulness back and forth, just banter. That's kind of that's kind of my game. Okay. I'm not sure about it. I like kind of banter back and forth with classmates and friends there. Just giving each other grief, you sure. know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So no thoughts of that, you know, after you you become a priest, after you're <laughs> ordained, you know, because right now you're you're yeah. a deacon, he's a priest. But later on, you know, is, is that, <laughs> is there something that may be expected? Well, if I told you, there wouldn't be any surprise. <laughs> ah, <for me>. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I mean, I have to say it was very interesting that Father Chad didn't mention it during his interview when we did talk about pranks, but Deacon Christopher did. <laughs> well, he was involved in it. He was, they were working together. So. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah. He didn't. He didn't mention that he was one of the masterminds. Huh? Oh, that's funny how he didn't mention that. But no, he was very much involved in it. it. May not have been his idea, but he was. They, yeah, they were filming it. They knew. I think the whole hallway knew. Oh, really? At the time, what happened? That was going on. Oh boy! It's like being in the Truman Show. He was like, "What's happening?" You know. <laughs> oh, everyone else knew, and yeah. except for you. Oh yeah. boy! Wow. Okay. Now, let's talk about the priest versus seminarian basketball game. It's coming up. It's coming up. Is there has there been a lot of uh, trash talk regarding that? Not as much as in past years. Uh, honestly, it's funny because usually I'm like usually it's a ton. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Within the first the first two or three years, there were a lot. There was a lot of trash talk, a lot of back and forth. Um, but this year not as much. We haven't played in what two years, right? Because yes. of COVID last year, and then uh huh, it hasn't been scheduled. But um. I'm very much looking forward to it. I can't wait. Uh, playing against my brother for the last time. Right? Oh, yeah. So That's every right. year I get to play against my brother and play basketball. So uh-huh. uh, looking forward to that. Looking forward to beating the priests for the third time in a row. Oh, so, you're um, calling it. Oh, yeah. We're going to beat the priests. Oh, well, I mean, you do have a little bit of an advantage because the team is able to gel. You're all seminarians. You can you spend more time together practicing. Exactly. We have more time to practice. We have a, an awesome coach. So we're able to spend more time practicing and just being together. Who's your coach? 
uh, Dunbar, Coach Dunbar, Larry Dunbar. He's wonderful. He knows what he's doing, and he can coach us well, right? A good coach knows his team, and he can just coach them according to who they are, right? So it just works well. We, we blend, and I think we have the upper hand there. How many years have you played with the team? Uh, ever since I started. So ever since I joined seminary, I've been playing basketball with the guys there in the various tournaments. But uh-huh. um, but as far as the priest game, right, this is the— Yes. Uh, uh, this will be—I've played every every game. Ever, ever since. And how many years has it been that— This is the uh, fifth year. The fifth time, and of course, not counting the gap because of COVID mm-hmm. yeah. in the middle. Okay. Now, how does it look now on now that you're like a senior, right? You're you're losing your eligibility to play with the seminary yeah. seminarians team. What's your perspective on the of the game? Is this your last chance? Yeah, this is my last chance to make a <laughs> game winning shot. No, um, no, it's it's I can't wait. It's fun. It's, it, this is a, a wonderful event for vocations, right? This is a wonderful event for our archdiocese promoting just a family event that can come together and celebrate uh, just vocations, right? In a wonderful, fun way. Mm-hmm. And it's more than basketball, right? I mean, you've seen the crowds, right? You've seen some of the highlights. We have yes. highlight videos, right? Yes. But it, it brings a lot of people together in a different light, right? It shows priests and seminarians in... Yeah, in a different setting. In a different setting, Right. No vestments on, but we have jerseys on, right? We uh-huh. have playing basketball. Sometimes it can get a little rough, but I mean, it's it's all in good fun. It's all in 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 this fraternity that we share in. Who are the the MVPs in the past years? Uh, Father Ryan Stallways was uh-huh. an MVP. Uh, Father Houston was Father an Houston. MVP. Yeah. Um, and was Father David Michael an MVP one year? He could have been. I don't remember. Other uh-huh. than those two, I don't recall. Um, okay. You might have to ask somebody else about that. So now that you, you you don't have Father Houston on your team, because last time he was on, so the MVP switched sides. He did. How is that affecting? Well, he'll be tough. Uh, he'll be someone we'll have to focus on and guarding well. But um, I spent a lot of years guarding him, playing as a seminary, didn't practice. So okay. I think I match up with him pretty well. Oh. Similar build. This is interesting. <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah. Our, our, are you going to give away any tactics right now? You know, no, I would never do that. No, online, no. <laughs> uh, but it'll be fun. We do look forward to that. All right, so we're looking at your you being ordained in a couple of months. Has there been any whispers regarding where you might land? Well, no As, whispers uh, that I've heard of where I'm going to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can take jabs at it, right? I mean, I can take, I can take just guesses about where I'll end up. But like I said before, I, I imagine I'll be somewhere at like a medium sized parish to a larger uh-huh. suburban parish. I mean, this parish is pretty large. So uh huh. Who knows? Um, and Father David Michael. Father David Michael. He's gonna come off the board. Well yeah. Maybe, really. you know, um we don't know. We don't find out where we're gonna go until the day before we're ordained. I mean, there's chatter. There's always just, but it, it's all at pulling at straws here. We don't know, but um, it could be anywhere. Where's the Vegas odds for you? Where would you think uh, you you might be sent? Is there maybe, one or maybe, two parishes? Maybe that... maybe Saint Anthony of Padua, maybe Sacred Heart Conroe, maybe here. Who knows? Yeah. Is there a a, a dream spot? Would you like to go back to your home parish? Go back oh, to Saint Martha. Yeah, I would love to go back to those parishes. It's a priest. That would be amazing. Uh, that won't. I, they won't send me back to Prince of Peace anytime soon. Why is that? Because that's my home parish. It's too familiar to me. Mm. Uh, they want to give me new experiences. Spread your wings a little. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Now, it's not unprecedented because remember earlier I talked about my uncle being, oh. being a priest of the diocese. Yes. He was actually pastor of his home parish at Holy Name. So... The small parish that he grew up in, he ended up being pastor of that parish uh, in his priesthood. So there's precedence. Really exciting. If anybody's listening, Cardinal, <laughs> uh, could happen. Father Dad said that when he he was ordained, he cried his eyes out while mm-hmm. he was, you know, laying prostrate. Are, any chances 
It's funny you mentioned that because I have memories of my uncle sharing that with me. So my uncle, Bishop Oscar, Uncle Oscar, was the pastor at the first assignment in which Father Dat was assigned to. Mm. Father Dat was a parochial vicar at Holy Name, right? And yes. he went there with uh, with my uncle. And so, and many of the, one of the conversations that I had recently with him in the past few years, he had, as a pastor, you know who's going to be coming up, right? You know who you're, who you're going to get in the future, or at least ahead of time. And he knew that he was going to be given Father Dat as his new vicar. So uh, he was like, okay, this is the new guy. So he was at the, he was present at the ordination Uh and he noticed how just visibly emotional and just overbearingly (laughs) like sobbing, (laughs) snotting, you know, that father that was so emotional at his ordination. He's like, man, I'm going to get this cry baby for my... (laughs) For my vicar. <laughs> That's exactly what Father Dad said. Yeah. Like, so but, do you see yourself breaking down, especially after all those years of uncertainty? It could happen. It could happen. Um, I was actually emotional during my diaconate. Really? Um, what was that like? Oh, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. Uh, yeah, it was during that time when you're laying, when I was laying prostrate. The litany of the saints, it was so powerful. Um, I think the three of us were, my classmates, uh, me and, and Luis and Chris, we were all emotional. I remember looking over at both of them. Yeah, we were all like wiping our eyes. And But I mean, it's, I'm very much looking forward to it. I can't, yeah, I can't wait. I know it's going to be, um, it's been a long time coming. Wow. Now, looking back at your journey, the early uncertainty, you know, those years of struggle, especially you know, with um, with your experiences in the different parishes, what advice do you have to someone who may be discerning the priesthood? I would say to, uh, it's okay to take it one day at a time and take it slow. It's not something to jump into. Um, I tried that. <laughs> I tried as, as hard as I could. I tried to jump into it uh, too soon or not knowing enough about myself, right? So, as, as someone who has spent seven years in formation, you learn a lot about yourself, right? You learn a lot about who you are as a man and your relationship with God. So that has to be the foundation. You can't go through seminary without, without developing and strengthening this foundation, this relationship with Christ. I would say take it a day at a time. Take it, take it slow. Get, find a good spiritual director. Do a lot of reading, right? Read spiritual works. Read Lives of the Saints. Read church history. You'll do all that in school, right? You'll do all that in formation. Right? Uh-huh. But yeah, reach out and make friends who are in seminary. Talk to people. You got to do a lot of work. You got to reach out. Uh-huh. You can't just sit back and let this happen to you. It's got to be something you take ownership of, right? Now, you said... Getting to know yourself, I I would imagine there's a lot of self-reflection, huh? I mean, you know, myself, if you go on a retreat, Mm -hmm. it's emotionally draining. And you would have that experience probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, as a seminarian, doing things like that over and over again. Yes. Yeah, we have retreats every year. And uh, one of the most powerful retreats uh, I had, I just came off of in January. It was a silent retreat, right? It was a an eight day silent retreat that was directed with a priest. So a lot of that time was just space. Yeah. It was just, it's you and the Lord, right? It's Uh it's about you and the Lord spending time with him and his presence. And then talking to a priest about your prayer experiences from one hour a day. But other than that, it's you and God. It's, this is it. That's what it's about, right? Because that's the foundation of your, of your ministry. Yeah. If that's not present, your ministry, my ministry, will will not be fruitful. So there is a possibility that uh, somebody would enter the seminary, think they're, you know, oh, I'm destined to become a priest. They go into the seminary, they start doing a whole lot of self-reflecting, and then they realize certain things about themselves. Oh, maybe I'm not meant to become a priest, or maybe I'm not, you know, there are yeah. certain parts of my personality that just aren't cut out. Is that, that I would assume that's a possibility, huh? Yeah, Absolutely. That's something that either they realize themselves 
or formation faculty will realize and make you aware of it, right? Were there ever any years that you, you know, you got to the evaluation and you're like, ooh, this might be the year that, you know. No, sadly, no, it's been a roller, <laughs> it has, <laughs> has not been a roller coaster. I had the roller coaster before seminary. Okay. Um, but no, that wasn't really, I was never worried. Oh, shoot, what's going to happen in, in this <laughs> meeting? I was never worried about it. I was never blindsided. Um, the four meters are pretty good about trying to be upfront with you. So you know what to expect. So I know what to expect. Like my, my four meter this year is, is um, very good in, in the way of communicating things that need to be said beforehand. So you're not blindsided. You're not, whoa, where is this coming from? You know? Uh huh. Now let's talk about the, the concert for life. Now with Father David Michael, how did you get involved with that? Uh, by an invitation, right? It was just an invitation uh, from Father David Michael. So he knew that you played. Yeah, we guitar. we had um, we had uh, spent some time together playing together in the seminary. Uh huh. The, at the time in sem- <laughs> at St. Mary's, there was a contemporary choir. There's no longer one now, but um, uh-huh. we had one at the time. And Father David Michael was in charge of the contemporary choir, right? So Friday morning mass is was the contemporary mass. So with uh, an element of like worship style music. Okay. So he was in tr- he was in charge of that, and I played along with him. Right? I told you that was kind of my foot in the door. Okay. Back in, back in high school. Uh huh. So, and I had led mini- I had led music ministry in college, and okay. after I had done weddings, I had done this and done that. So I had I was. That was very much a part of uh, of what I did. So I helped out. And then the following year, he passed the baton to me. He's like, hey, Jacob, why don't you lead next year? So he gave me the keys, you know. So you had played together. It's not like he had, you know, he, he had heard that you played mm-hmm. and then he just invited you. So you guys right. have had experience playing with one another. Right, right. He, he invited me uh, based on us playing together before. Mm-hmm. Oh. And how many, it was this past year, was this your first time to play with him during the concert for life or have you done it? Uh, I, I can't recall. Uh, it's my third year playing with him. Third year. Mm-hmm. Okay. And how is it each year? Is it different? Pretty much uh, the same thing? You, you know what to expect or? Yeah, I would say I know what to expect. Um, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of fun, right? A lot of, a lot of show, a lot of lights, um, but yeah, the fraternity part there is pretty is pretty wonderful. I mean, the musicians, those, right? We're all in the same in the same ministry here, on the same track. So you have played with Father Ryan. Mm-hmm. How I did. how different was it? The feel of the band that you know he wasn't there. Yeah, it was it was definitely sad. Um, it, it was a little emotional, right? I think Father David Michael wrote a song, right, of, uh, just mem- uh, in memory of him. Yes. And that was quite emotional, but um, yeah, it was different not having him there. Um, thankful to Father Victor, Father Victor for for stepping in mm-hmm. and playing drums. Uh, very talented as well, but yeah, Father Father Ryan was was a part of it from the beginning. So, and Father Ryan even uh, was involved with me in, at seminary. So when I was in charge oh. of the contemporary choir, Father Ryan always was there providing some. Some percussion, right? Oh, he, wow. So you played he, there he, as well. He played the djembe. I was on guitar. Uh-huh. Uh, Father Chad was even part of that contemporary choir. Right? He was playing bass. So there were a lot of guys who helped out. Wow. Wow. Well, we thank you so much for coming into the show, and we thank you for sharing your story. And we, we look forward to seeing where you land, you know, after ordination. Yeah. Looking forward to that uh you you receiving that letter and everybody finding out where you who knows you might even be here at Saint Faustina, could be don't know yet. Um, I'm excited too, Rudy. I can't I can't wait. Uh, I very much look forward to it and look forward to start start ministry uh, as a priest in a few months. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much and, and God bless you. Thank you, Rudy. You too. God bless.